Thank you. So uh, when I wrote this talk, I thought that I was going to give a bunch of examples about how you analyze memory and uh, see what the different allocators and things, how they work in the Yellow virtual machine and spend a lot of focus on doing actual examples. It turned out that the theory of this stuff is quite complicated, so it's more of a theory talk and then having some stories at the end rather than being uh, stories focused. So uh, I'm going to talk about the, the problem and why there are memory allocators in the Erlang virtual machine, what they're used for, so and the different handling. Going to go all through all of the different concepts with the memory allocators so that you get the terminology right, so that you know uh, the different uh, options you want to set and so on and so forth and get to know what the different things you're talking about when you're talking about blocks, when you're talking about uh, carriers and so on. Going to have a look at the statistics that you can gather. There's a lot of statistics, and the main reason for we, the reason why we have the allocators implemented the way we are is because we can gather the statistics about your system and try to figure out, okay, is this an optimal way of your using your memory? And we're going to have a look at two different uh, cases where we've been looking at the statistics that we can get from the memory allocators, making modifications, and hopefully making the system work better. Uh, and at the end, we'll have a look at some of the new features because there's a lot of development happening with the allocators. We spend a lot of time optimizing these things and trying to shrink and get the fragmentation to become smaller and uh, smaller. So the reason why we have uh, memory allocators in the Erlang virtual machine, so the memory allocators are there is because the normal uh, malloc and so on are relatively small. Uh, relatively slow for very small allocations. So when you're allocating some small ETS object somewhere, it's quite a heavy operation to have to do a syscall and go all the way down. So we kind of cache memory up in the virtual machine. Also, in order to battle fragmentation, we use different strategies for how to allocate data. Allocating something like a module is something that where you, okay, so you want to spend a lot of time finding the correct place to allocate that memory, but allocating something like a message being sent to another process, you don't want to spend as many CPU cycles trying to find the perfect place in memory because it will be deallocated when you receive the message. So we have different strategies depending on what type of mes uh, memory that we're allocating. Uh, also, there's no way to get the statistics in a cross-platform manner that we want to have out of the allocators if you want to just use malloc or something like that. If you want to try on your system and run it without the Erlang allocators and just use malloc uh, from the beginning, you pass that flag to the Erlang virtual machine and it will disable everything. And then you just run a normal malloc. Sometimes uh, this is faster. I was uh, looking at a benchmark uh, that's called eStone and was going to see, okay, so how much faster is, are these allocators? And I switched them off and the benchmark went faster than using the allocators. So it's not always, but that's what you get for synthetic benchmarks. In real production environments, they help a lot. Uh, there's another benchmark that I've been running for to do uh, 4G telephone benchmark thing. And there, there it's, it's about 50% speed up to using these allocators rather than using uh, malloc and so on. So in real world applications, it's usually better for small benchmarks the overhead sometimes beats over. Uh, the allocators also help a lot when you're doing uh, NUMA, so lots of cores and lots of things. So going on talking a bit about the concept. So we have uh, these are the four main things we're going to talk about. So carriers and blocks, single versus multi-block carriers, uh, how the multi-block allocators work, and what's uh, the thread specific allocators. So talking about a block, so this is terminology so that we can talk about these things. A block is one continuous piece of memory that the Erlang virtual machine needs. This is something like, for instance, when you do a ETS insert, that piece of data becomes a block. A heap and a stack of a Erlang process is a block. A message being sent to, from one process to another is copied inside a block. So it's a continuous piece of C memory. Uh, we have carriers. Carriers is something, a container that contains one or more blocks. So we have something looking like that. So we have a header saying, okay, so this is a carrier of this type uh, with these settings and so on. And we put the block into it. And as we continue with more operations on the ETS table, we put more and more data, hopefully in a good place, into the block. 
and then we delete something and we get fragmentation. And we might end up with something looking like this. Now these blocks, when you have like this, they are normally, we align them. Uh, in a normal Allen emulator, they're aligned at an 18-bit limit. So they're about 256 kilobytes minimum. So they're aligned at that limit. And that allows us to do lots of optimizations uh, in order to do that. Uh, the size of how much memory can be allocated is controlled with a lot of different settings. I'm going to see some of the settings here. There's a, but before I do that, we talk about single and uh, multi-block carriers. So when looking at the statistics and the allocators, we have two different concepts here. So we have a single block carrier, which is oh, it's something that contains one block. So it's a carrier that contains one block uh, of memory. Uh, now, normally you want to put large for some definition of large blocks into one uh, carrier, uh, single block carrier. And if you have small blocks, you want to put them in the same carrier. This is because the operating system is quite good at handling large contiguous chunks of memory and single block carriers are usually used just allocated via malloc normally. Uh, large depends on your context. Sometimes large can be uh, just being something like 256 bytes. Sometimes it can be five megabytes. So it depends a bit about your context. The default is half a megabyte, which seems to work for most systems. So if you have a block of some sort that's smaller than 512 kilobytes, then it's placed in a multiple carrier. If it's bigger, it's placed in a single block carrier. And you control that by saying single block carrier threshold. So you set that there. Uh, normally, you want to have most of your data in a multi block carrier. So in a normal system that you're, you're running, you want to have most, I don't know, 80, 85, 90% of your data to be part of a multi-block carrier. Uh, so if you're realizing in a system that you're running that you have a lot of single block carriers and not a lot of multi-block carriers, you might want to raise the limit to say, okay, so my I know from uh, my code that I'm reading one megabyte messages from a TCP socket all the time. This becomes one megabyte binaries, and that's bigger than 512. Those always get put into single block carriers, so I might want to just adjust the threshold to say, okay, so it's going to be 1.5 megabytes, and then they put all of those carrier blocks into multi-block carriers, and hopefully your system will be a lot faster. Uh, when manipulating this threshold, you probably also want to change the size of the carriers that are being allocated. So if you're increasing the, si the size of the individual blocks, you want to increase the actual carriers that are being created. So if you increase the size to one, the threshold to one megabyte, the, I believe the default size of a multi-block carrier is two megabytes, the smallest one, and then it grows up into eight megabytes, uh, depending on how many carriers you have. So you might want to, uh, since you doubled the initial amount, you want, might want to double the next one as well so that you start at four megabytes and then grow up to 16 megabytes or something to that effect. Uh, there's quite a few different types of allocators. So these are different areas that you can configure individually how they work. So we have the heap allocator, the binary allocator, uh, the driver allocator, and the ETS allocator. So these are things that you can reason about as an Erlang programmer, uh, these allocators. And normally, these are the ones you tune. Uh, I've not seen a problem with any of the other allocators yet. Normally, somebody is allocating binaries that are growing out of hand, or they have many, many small ETS stuff that they're putting into tables, and they get fragmentation issues because of that. Uh, that's the two normal ones that you have problems with. Uh, there's also temporary, short-lived, standard-lived, long-lived, and fixed-size allocations. And these are emulator internal things. Uh, let's see, I think I have some, yeah. Uh, so the, different, the difference between these emulator internal things is temporary is a very short time. So something that lives just in a C function. Uh, so there's some examples for what it can be there. Standard is links, monitors, these kinds of C structs. Uh, short is something that lives across a, I don't know, a schedule of an Erlang functions, li lives for maybe four or five milliseconds, something like that. So it's long is things like code, atoms, things that we know that possibly could live forever. And then we have fixed alloc, which is uh, things we know are of a certain size, 
and we can make optimizations because of this. So process control blocks, port control blocks, and uh, lots of other things. If you want to find the exact things that there are, there's a file called erlalloc.types in the erlangotp repository under ERTS. All of the mappings are set there, and the mappings are different if you're running in a half-word emulator, if you're running a 64-bit, 32-bit, if you're running Windows, Unix, or some other things. So depending on what operating system that you built the Erlang virtual machine for, you will have different settings on these things. Uh, yeah. So talking a bit about, so single block carriers are quite easy. You don't have to manage them now. You have one block in one carrier, and that's it. And one carries one uh, chunk of memory requested from the operating system. So they're very easy to handle. Multi-blocks, on the other hand, are quite difficult. And you have lots of small areas because you need to keep track of where can I put this piece of memory. I need to place something that's eight bytes big, and I need to look for the best place to put it and spend a good amount of time for it. So we have a lot. We have a few. How many are there? Uh, seven different strategies that you can use in order to allocate where to put the blocks inside a multi-block carrier. So we have the block-oriented ones that are, these, these are strategies that span carriers. So if you have two carriers and you, uh, you, we then build a tree with all the free blocks of all the carriers that are in that allocator at the point. And we have best fit is just, well, it's the best fit. It looks for the one with the least waste. So if you have a block that's eight bytes and you find a slot that's nine and the next smaller slot is seven, then you put it in a nine slot and so on. Uh, address or the best fit works in the same way, only that if there's a tie, it uses the one with the lowest address rather than just taking the one that was put in the queue last. Uh, address order first fit tries to take the one with the lowest address that it can fit in. Uh, good fit takes the best, or a good fit to do it. You can tune with uh, settings what uh, you define as a good fit. So if you say that, okay, I'm, it's okay if it wastes 10% of the block. So if I have something that's 10 bytes big, then a good fit is something that doesn't waste more than 15 bytes. So something like that. So you can tune what you want to have a good fit to be. And a fit is mostly used for these temporary allocations that are really, really fast. So just finding something. We have the carrier-oriented ones. These are broken down so that you have, first you have a strategy to say how the carriers are organized, and then you have a strategy saying how the blocks within the carrier is organized. Uh, I'll get into, I think I'll get into more details about exactly how that works before. I have a picture here saying a small example about how best fit works. So here we have two carriers. Uh, the shaded areas are memory areas that are taken and the blue and red ones are free slots, so free memory areas. We build a tree looking something like this uh, of the different uh, carriers saying, okay, so we do a binary search tree. So this is, uh, I think it's a red, black balanced binary search tree that you look for the blocks in. And they end up looking something like this. So you have the smallest red one all the way to the right and then you have build up this tree of them. And the neat thing here is that this requires, of course, no memory to build this tree because we save the pointers of this tree in the free slots. So it doesn't actually take any memory to build this tree. And then we just search this tree to see, okay, which one can we find? Then we take a slot and then you take it out of the tree, rebalance, and then hopefully you found a good slot to be in. So I've been talking a lot about the blocks in there, so you have different blocks, but the carriers, where do they come from? So we have two different ways of allocating carriers in the runtime system. We have something called, we call the MSEG alloc allocator and the SIS alloc. So the MSEG allocator basically tries to shut up, it tries to shut out the operating system as much as possible and just allocates big segments. And this is normally used for the uh, multi-block carrier allocation. Uh, on Linux, it uses dev0, uh, opens that as a file, and then does mmap uh, with the different arguments in order to get large chunks of memory. One of the key things about the MSEG alloc is that it has a cache. So it has a cache of a certain size of uh, uh, carriers that was just returned to it. Uh, I think the default is 10, something like that. 
And on a normal system, and most that I see, yeah, we have a cash rate, hit rate of about 80, 85%. So normally, when you were re reusing a lot of carriers uh, in a system. Uh, Sysalloc is just a call to a uh, malloc free or post 6 memo line, depending on your operating system. Um, it allocates pieces of memory in multiples of a variable you can set there. That's called mu something something. Uh, so it's, I think the default is two megabytes. So it allocates two megabytes no matter if you want to have something that's, uh, let's say, one megabyte. And it over allocates two megabytes in order to make it easier for the operating system to get less fragmentation of its things. We've had a lot of problems with uh, projects that have had uh, fragmentation of their virtual memory space. So this is why we help malloc in order to have these nice chunks that it can manage and get it perfect. Sysalloc is also used to allocate what we call the main carrier. The main carrier is the initial carrier, so the first one that's always there during startup. The idea with the main carrier is that you have a sufficient memory in order to do a normal boot up of an Alang emulator without doing any extra allocations in order to speed up uh, starting something. Uh, okay. Uh, so, another picture. And now we're getting into uh, different schedulers. So, here we have a picture of, yeah, we have short lived alloc, e heap, binary, and all of the different things. They request carriers from MSEG alloc. All of these, we have one chain of these per scheduler in the system. So all of these are local. So you have one ETS alloc for scheduler one, one ETS alloc for scheduler two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all local, and they can take, a, take advantage of uh, the NUMA architecture of your system. So an allocation is always close to you, uh, et cetera. And these small mailboxes there say that if, of course, we have to pass memory around between schedulers. So if we want to do a free of something that we passed over, we have to send a message to that scheduler in order to do the free because we don't have any locks at all on the actual allocators because we want to these to be lock free. So we're doing them by a message passing between the schedulers to the allocations. In, uh, was it R16BO2, we added a carrier pool that's shared between the different uh, schedulers. Uh, you get access to this if you use the carrier-oriented algorithms that I was talking about before. Uh, so if you use something like the address order, best fit carrier, first fit block or something like that, you get access to this pool. This pool gets populated of carriers that are below a certain percentage of utilization. So if you have a carrier on scheduler N that has a utilization of say 20%, so it has quite a high fragmentation, then uh, that scheduler can give that uh, piece of carrier, that carrier to the pool and somebody that needs a carrier. So if scheduler one needs a new carrier to allocate data in, it can take that from the pool rather than having that from somewhere else. Uh, you lose some of the NUMA things, of course, but you get better memory utilization, which is nice. Uh, for all of the async threads and all of the driver threads and everything, there's a global allocator that has a big lock in front of it and all of the data gets put into there. So if, for instance, you're reading a file with binaries, those binaries get put into this global allocator. Uh, let's see, yeah. And all of these are MSEG. There weren't, an, as if there weren't enough layers here, we have something called Earth's MMAP at the bottom as well that was added in R16B03, I believe. That does something fancy as well. Or if you want to know the details, just ask me afterwards. Uh, there. So that's a general theoretical background for these things. Uh, so getting statistics and trying to figure out what's wrong. So let's dig down into some of these things. So we had the different types of allocators, and they're called things like this when we're talking about the statistics part of them. Uh, so if you do Erlang system info allocator, you get information about which allocators are active in your system. It's not always the same, and it's definitely not always the same over releases. But doing this, you can get an information about what features are enabled in your system. You get all of the different settings that you've set in your system, so you can figure out what your threshold is or what your multiple carrier allocation strategies are, or 
things like that. And the features, like if you have, an, if you have a PO6 memory line in your system, if you can lock physical memory in place rather than trying to get the uh, Linux way of doing memory management in there and lots of other things. Now you can dig into more detail uh, even more. So if you say Erlang system info allocator and then put one of the types I had here in the previous slide, so eheap alloc, ets alloc, something like that, you get a list of tuples with lots and lots of data. Uh, you can see that we have first is structured in instances. So instance zero is the global allocator that's used for async threads. Instance one is for scheduler one. Instance two is for scheduler two, etc., etc., etc. For each instance, we have the version of the allocator used, the option set, statistics about the multi-block carriers, statistics about the single block carriers, and statistics about the calls made by the carrier. I'm going to break this down for you, and we'll see. So this is what you get out of the data. I put it in a table for you so you don't have to read the data stuff. So what we get is that we get the current value. We get the maximum value of that part sends the last call to get the statistics. And we get the maximum value of the system lifetime. Uh, and we can see the number of blocks uh, there. So we have so 1 million, 1 million, and 1.8 million blocks in there. And we get the total size of all of the blocks in there. I think I actually have a, yeah, see, there. So we have 820 megabytes there, 820 there, and we had a maximum when we had a peak of 3.3 gigabytes of memory. And we can see the carriers, we fit these uh, 1.6, uh, 1 million blocks into 455 carriers. And we can see the carrier sizes down there as well. Uh, a single block carrier would, of course, have the same amount of blocks that it has carriers. And we can see that the block size is 6620. But since we're over allocating a bit, the carrier size is 7.5 and 25. So uh, quite simple. The number of calls that you can see, you can see that we've done quite a few uh, calls. Let's see. Yeah, so quite many. So it's 28,000 mega calls has been done to the binary alloc. So quite a few binaries have been allocated here. We've freed roughly the same amount, which is a good thing. Otherwise, we'd have the memory leak. And we've been able to reallocate some of them as well. And we can see that MSEG alloc has done 24,000 of the allocations, while SIS alloc has done zero. So this is a good thing. There. Uh, so that's for the single block and multi block uh, things. So you can also get statistics about the carrier allocators. Uh, we can get the number of segments, cache information, uh, seeing when we get an alloc, dealloc, and destroy. So here you can see the caching working. So you have MSEG alloc calls 464 over there, while actually we've only created 40 carriers. So we have a quite a high cache hit rate there, saying that we've done 460 calls, and only 40 of them ended up in an OS call. Uh, there. OK. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm just thinking if, how much time I have, which seems to be plenty. That's good. So some case studies to see how you analyze these things and get this data once uh, you understand what they mean. So I've run across two cases. Uh, uh, I'll run across many cases, but these ones are quite uh, useful for the open source community because you guys seem to run into them a lot more than uh, our commercial customers. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is one I call large binaries. So there was this person that realized that, hey, I'm running S-trace, and I know that these allocators are supposed to be really efficient, and they should be using MMAP to allocate all my stuff. But for some reason, it's not using MMAP. It's using malloc instead. So it's using a lot more malloc. So if, when I started to, so I requested the statistics for the binary allocators uh, in there. And you could see that there was about yeah, 300 mega calls being done to binary alloc. Uh, and we have about 0 0.4 mega calls being done to MSEG alloc. So here we have a discrepancy because we want to have, we want to have most of our stuff into the MSEG allocator, not the system allocator. Because MSEG allocator means that we're using multi-block carriers. 
while the system allocator means that we're using single block carriers, mostly. Uh, and we can see here that we have a sysalloc call of 1.4 mega calls. So quite a discrepancy there. So this is when uh, Bell started whistling for me saying, no, something is wrong with these settings. So we, at this point, you can kind of reason out that, okay, so something is wrong with uh, seeing with how the threshold is set for which things are being put here. I know that this is binary alloc, so, some, so this person is allocating larger binaries than the actual single block carrier threshold for most of the binaries, and therefore they're pushed into single block carriers, uh, which is not as efficient. Uh, going back, we can see that the multi-block carrier size is about 2.4 uh, gigabytes, and the single block carrier size is 11 gigabytes of memory. So it's a big discrepancy. Normally you wanted to have the reverse, if not even more in favor of uh, multi-block carriers uh, in there. So what can we do about this? So we want to adjust the single block carrier threshold somehow, but how should we adjust it? So looking at the statistics, you can also get the average block size that's in the single block carriers uh, in there. So you take the number of blocks and divide it by the total size of the carriers. And we can see that the block size is about 1.68 megabytes. That is, uh, in this case, it was reading from a TCP socket. In there. So now we have a block size that we know, okay, so this is the average block size. So we probably want to bit, go a bit over that size uh, when we're tuning the allocators. Uh, and in the end, we ended up setting it to two megabytes, which is a reasonable limit above there, and it's a nice clean number. Uh, so that put binaries that are greater than two megabytes into single block carriers, while it puts them that are smaller than two megabytes into the multi block carriers. And thus, since multi-block carriers are being done by MMAP and you get the caching of the MSEG and all that, the performance increase was quite good, I believe. And you also, of course, increase the largest multi-block carrier size and the smallest multi-block carrier size. That's what these two last ones say. For only the binary allocator. And this is where the strength of the Erlang runtimes allocators come in because you can say that I only want these settings for the binary allocators because if you set these settings for all of the allocators, then you will have a problem most probably with the ETS or something like that where it over allocates more memory than you really want in your system. So you can specify saying, I have a problem with only binary allocations, so therefore I put only binary tunings into, my, into the emulator. Okay, so second case that I was running into is, uh, uh, was actually helping uh, Fred Herbert with a problem at Heroku, uh, which he wrote a big blog post about. So uh, this is that, if you've read that blog post. Uh, the symptoms that he was having was that Erlang memory total was showing about seven gigabytes of used memory. But the top in his operating system was, used, uh, was showing that it was, hey, 15 gigabytes of memory was being used by the beam. And then all of a sudden, uh, he, got, he got some kind of small traffic spike, and you got a crash dump, ETS alloc, failed to allocate. And he was confused because, hey, I have, it says I have seven gigabytes only, and then it was 15 gigabytes, and I don't have memory to allocate these things. Now, the thing to know about Erlang memory total is that is the total area of the blocks in your system. It's not the total area of the carriers in your system. So there's a discrepancy there where it's only the used areas that is Erlang memory total. It's not the actual allocated from the operating system. So if you see a discrepancy between what Erlang memory gives and what the uh, top in uh, your operating system gives, most probably you have some kind of fragmentation problem with your allocators uh, in there. So again, looking at the statistics in there, uh, we can see that he had a uh, lot of blocks and they had a block size that was uh, starting up, it was at the moment was 1.6 uh, gigabytes for these. Um, uh, I believe this is just one instance, so it's only one scheduler. But we can see, and he had a max carriers, uh, max block size of 7.8, uh, 6.8, sorry. But we can see that the carrier size was largely the same for the current and the maximum. So this is where the problem is. You have a fragmentation in the allocations of these binaries. So for some reason, the allocators were allocating binaries in lots of the different carriers, but when they were releasing them, it was not releasing all of the binaries within a carrier. 
So there was one binary there, one binary there, and it was impossible to release these carriers. And then he got a spike in ETS inserts. And you cannot put ETS data into a carrier put for uh, binary allocation. And therefore, we tried to create ETS carriers, and you run out of memory. So again, we had to know uh, what the average block size is. So we can set, see that uh, the blocks were about 800 bytes per block when we were at current. They had a peak of 1.7 megabytes per block. And the carriers were about 7.8, uh, 7.7 megabytes per carrier. This is something you would expect. But if you take the block size and divide it by the carrier size, we had a utilization of about 22% uh, when running at the current, which is not good at all. But when we're at max, we are at 93%, which is quite okay. Uh, so what we want to do here is to find a better strategy for allocating these binaries so that we don't get a, in a scenario when we're freeing binaries that the, the carriers cannot be returned to the operating system. So what we ended up changing there was to use uh, the, no, the default allocator for binary is a normal best fit allocator. By using the address order best fit, we're trying to squeeze allocations further down into the memory space and therefore compacting them. Spending a couple of CPU cycles doing this, but in the big scheme of things, uh, didn't notice any difference. We also shrunk the size of the largest multi-block carriers so that do, by doing this, we were hoping that the statistics would be in our favor so that we could free more of the carriers. And that turned out to be the case as well. Uh, I think his, I don't know exactly what his dip, dips are nowadays, but it's not at 20%, it's more like 50% or 40%, which saves the system in a lot of cases. So it doesn't have to deal with these crashes anymore. Uh, yeah, and uh, some of the new features that have been coming up lately. So I was talking about uh, the pool that was coming in R16 B01. So this can only be migrated from things we, with the same type. So it's a migration in between schedulers, but it's still binary to binary uh, migration. So you cannot migrate something from a binary allocation to a ETS uh, allocation yet. Uh, this is something that we will probably get to work on uh, eventually, I hope. So this will not save uh, the fragmentation problem, having this pool, but it helps when you're having a scenario where you're allocating a lot on every schedulers in high load, and then your load shrinks uh, for once, and then it helps a lot, and you get a lot of deallocations. Uh, the reason for this introduction is that we had a customer that was seeing a memory growth as the load of the system decreased, which is not really what you want to see, because he had a peak, and then we allocated lots of memory, lots of memory, and then the load shrunk, and he was just allocating memory in one scheduler, but he was not able to use the carriers in the other schedulers, and therefore the memory of that scheduler increased, and he wasn't able to deallocate in the other schedulers. So by migrating these carriers into scheduler one, we solved that problem. Uh, in R60, this, by the way, is being turned on by default in 17. So check your system and see if you want to have it on or not. We have only seen positive effects of this, but it might be possible that there are some downsides for it. Uh, in R16 BO3, we added something called a super carrier, which is where the Earth's MMAP uh, functionality was added. So this is a way for us to pre-allocate a huge chunk of memory for the Yalang virtual machine at startup, so that we don't have to request memory for the operating system. Uh, the reason why we put this in is because we have a virtualized environment where one of our customers is running that where it took about 20 seconds to do a malloc. So it was taking a long time and their tests were timing out for some reason. So we put this in place so that they could pre-allocate 8 gigabytes of memory and don't have to request it from the operating system at such small intervals. Uh, it can also be used in order to limit the amount of memory that the Allang virtual machine uses but uh, U-Limit is a better tool for that than using this. Why is that? Why is U-Limit better than putting on supercarriers well, You get the same result, and uh, uh, I think the operating system in general is better at managing these th things because you kind of, 
the reason why we use do single block uh, carries as operating system allocations is because it can cheat by taking memory from caches and so on and so on. By if we are allocating things with our, with uh, doing mmap, we don't get the caches that malloc uses and so on. So we don't get access to all of the memory that's in the system. So, but if you use u limit, you don't get the downside, but you get the same benefits. Yeah. So I am done with that. So questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, there's one supercarrier for each uh, for the entire system, and how does that work with the new architecture? I don't think we've done any benchmarks on that actually to see how that works. Uh, the implementation about how it takes carriers and so on, I'm a bit fussy about, so I'm not 100% sure. But it's, it's some kind of taking on the same sides and allocating things. Don't know. Unfortunately, is the answer. Yes. So with the migration of carriers, so you mentioned when uh, one scheduler remains active, it may just start migrating from other schedulers. How that works in Numa? Because if they got allocation. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, the, so the question is, how does the migration of carriers work in the, in a Numa system? So yes, you can have problems with that. Definitely, uh, it, you will have remote memory accesses where you might not want them to be. But if you do not want to have this behavior, it's very easy to shut off, and then you, you don't have to deal with that. In systems that do not have a lot of uh, new interactions with different things, it's just beneficial to do it. Uh, normally, you don't want to have the scenario anyway where memory is being al allocated and not released from these other parts uh, in there. So yeah, it's a. Yeah. Yeah, well, as, as long as you do, when you do message passing or interacting in an environment, you, you cannot, the, we don't group things in NUMA nodes for processes in order to, for them to not have the overhead. And, and if you send a message from one process to something in another NUMA node, the memory of that message will remain in the original NUMA node. So you have a lot of these things uh, anyway. But it tries to help out with the fragmentation point, points of it. Well, so the question is, what's the S plus one? So let's see if I go back to the picture, so see if I can explain that better. Uh, there we go. So, well, so I guess the S plus one that I was talking about is just one plus, that's the two one. So, it, uh, and the third is zero. Uh, the, the thread pool is zero, and then you have one is the first scheduler, two is the second scheduler, and three is the third scheduler, and so on and so on. I might have made a mistake in the slides only. It's, uh, it's no, there's nothing at the end okay. over there. So it just ends at the last scheduler. Okay. Yeah? So um, the disk used to run as a Uh, so the question is if the NIFs use the drive allocators. No, they use the heap allocators. You're allocating directly on the heap uh, for things when you're building stuff there. Of course, if you make a binary that's bigger than 64 bytes, it will end up in the binary allocator. But NIFs have the ad advantage of building stuff directly on the heap, which is why they're a bit faster when calling small stuff than drivers. Yeah, unless, of course, you grow over the heap size, then it will create the heap, what we call a heap fragment, which is still part of the heap allocators, but it's a different memory area. Yeah, all of the fragments always get collapsed when you do a garbage collection. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is, where can I find information about this stuff without reading the source code? Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. Without reading, <laughs> without reading my mind, yes. Well, there are two other minds that you can read as well. Uh, but yes, uh, in part of getting, doing the work to, with uh, Fred to get the uh, fragmentation problem, uh, I was working together with him to, for his tool that's called Recon. And there's a module in there called Recon Alloc. Uh, that does, analyze, does some basic analysis for you and tries to figure out what's in the system. And it has maybe seven or eight functions uh, there that analyzes different aspects of things, problems that we've encountered. Uh, we're trying to add more things to it, but what I find is that most of the problems that you encounter are unique. So it's like, yeah, this is, I, it's not like, oh, this is a general problem for everybody because then it would be a general setting. But if it's a, it's almost always a specific problem that somebody is having because they've written their code in a certain way and therefore this happens. But for this fragmentation parts and finding out if there's many single block carriers rather than multi block carriers in these things, there are functions in this library that can do that. With a lot of documentation explaining all of this stuff, the documentation is almost better than the tool, I would say. So just reading the documentation explains most of the things that I did in my slides here. You're welcome. Any more questions? No? All right. Thank you for your time.